are the what are the key considerations that people should be looking at when they're to make sure they're getting the, giving themselves the best opportunity to get their loan approved? So what are the key aspects of it? Um, Five seasons, so to speak. Let's say uh, first and foremost, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. So <laughs> like get yourself organized, get your ducks lined up, talk to people, be prepared. Look, we um, it's not uncommon for a contract of sale to hit our desk with someone who hasn't prepared themselves for finance. Uh, but I tell you, if you can prepare yourself for it, you're going to make the process a whole lot easier for yourself. I do it day in, day out. So the stress and pressure is fine. It's manageable. Uh, but I for yourself, if you're um, if you're wanting to get in, get yourself prepared for it. So uh, you mentioned the five C's. Uh, we're all here on a boat, so uh, I, uh, I'm i going to mm. maybe talk about seven Cs to be uh, fitting with the image you guys pulled up. <laughs> so I, I think uh, character is the first one. So um, mm. who you are, <clears throat> what you do, um, what your credit history is like. That's, a, that's one that has probably come to a forefront over the last couple of months with all the um, data breaches that, you know, Telstra, AHM, all of those um, have had where people are becoming a little bit more aware of their credit files and uh, what their activity has been. But yeah, understanding what your um, your credit score is, what your uh, conduct in, on your existing facilities have been. Um, we do a complimentary credit report as part of our process. It's mandatory. Uh, if you're working with a broker and then not doing a check on your CCR, on your comprehensive credit report before you go for finance, then make sure, hit them up to, to do it. You can do it yourself free online. Uh, but understanding that the things that you do actually have an impact. So another um, interesting thing, we had one of our BDMs, business development <clears throat> uh, managers from the banks come in. I look at them as the champion between me and the lender, so when I'm championing you, they're championing me, um, that they actually said to us their credit teams are now Google searching people and uh, looking you up online and seeing what they can find about you. So, you know, you might have a, a score that stacks up, but, uh, you know. How deep do they go? Like, how, like you? you say that they yeah. do tests, like they look at your online profile. Like, how? what, what does that actually mean? So it's just um, ultimately when you're when you put in an application through the system, there's a whole lot of information that you're providing. So uh, who you are, where you live, um, where you work, how long you've lived and worked there, what your full asset liability position is, what your conduct is, how much you spend. Like they they want everything. They want blood. They want your firstborn child. And you have to declare that and say it's true, accurate. This is who you are. Um, I think where like some lenders will actually do employment checks, they will call your employer to check and verify. Um, oh, wow. They're looking at uh, at your pay slips, at the employer's ABN to verify that it's a legitimate business. Is the employer um, where you're uh, working, do they have a registered website? Like if they can't find the employer, um, RP data, you know, looking at, at property um if you say you live in a place and you're you're renting or like those things are visible now um depending on platform accessibility and subscriptions and those type of things but they do dive in let's go through the age range right let's okay let's uh, like the, the the 20s the 30s the 40s uh 50s and 60s i think that would lend us to a little bit more so you can so people in the audience can bundle themselves into a little bit of a when, bit of a bracket yeah. <laughs> um would that, would that get just, people's uh, interest perhaps i mean yeah perhaps but i guess uh, like i guess the the like let's just start at the 20s right we'll just breeze breeze through the 20s why are we breezing through the 20s 
because you're going to be fine, Mr. 20 year old. You have time on your side. Time. You're absolutely- what about 18? Don't worry about 20. I, I, I saw teens. so many people we'll bring on them teens. Up saying, when did you yeah. buy your first, what age were you when you first bought your first? And the amount of people I saw that said 18, 19, I was like, that's amazing. Wow. Like, how good, how good yeah. is it that we have a community of people do that? But, 20, okay, 20, okay, 20, okay. Early, at? early, uh, late teens, early 20s, <laughs> late 20s, and all 20s. What are I some of the things that, we need to think about? <laughs> I liked that you said you've got time on your hands because I think you know, uh, you can often um, be worried about what other people are doing around you, you're missing out. That that kind of mentality can be at any stage of your life. And I think when you recognize that you've got a whole lot more time on your hands, you've got the opportunity to um, take a few risks Mm -hmm. when you're younger um, than the, you know, the other end. Um, I think some of the restrictions or um, constraints, your income, uh, often, you know, you're either um, just starting your career or not knowing what your career is, uh, you might have, um, I think uh, it's like you can have 14 to 16 different jobs in your lifetime, which is about six different career changes. So oh. recognizing that your employment, you might be with one employer for two to three years and then change. So understanding that your your income will vary. You will start to earn more money. You gain experience. You invest in your education. Um, looking at, uh, I saw some stats around uh, over, I think it was also a similar thing around the last 30 years. There's been like a 30% increase in people actually getting higher education, and which is awesome because it means your ability to earn more money Um, as you gain more experience over time increases. Uh, The other side to that is you get these wonderful things called hex debts. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, I think with anything, when you obtain any kind of lending, there's a a purpose behind it for you to pay it off. So it is a vehicle for you for an education to be able to put yourself forward um, and not to think that, Oh, it comes out of my salary. It's going to be no problem. Um, I don't really see it. Uh, it actually does and can long-term impact your borrowing because it's a and liability. And they, they, they charge the interest on hex as well, don't they? Like what? What? what they they change that as well. Like it doesn't. It's not just a set interest rate. So it's kind of like a home loan. It went up like seven point six percent. I think it was going up like one one percent, one point five, and then they they hit people with like a seven percent rise or something, and um. Yeah, I spoke to a client and it was just, oh, I was making repayments down, you know, paying off my my hex debt and then I just got hit with an extra couple of thousand dollars. So it is one of those things that people do uh, forget about it as they go through and it's, I'm talking now like you're in your 30s and you're not really, you're working full time, that type of thing. Um, but mm. having a, a strategy to see, okay, well, what impact does it have on your borrowing and what can you do to eliminate it, clear it? You get a, you know, there's different strategies. I'm not going to provide any advice around which one is best, but it really is understanding what your options are and understanding what impact that it it does have when those things hang around. Thirties and forties, right? You're becoming more financially stable. You you're starting to get more absolutely. Hopefully, you're starting to get more responsibilities, right? Like we now have a pet dog, um, precursor to kids. That you now have starting to have kids. Like like things are starting to compound and add to the list of things that you have to think about. But um, oh, the yeah. responsibilities. Responsibilities. How do yes. we think about this for lending? So, um, I think when we're we're kind of looking at this age group, um, there can be two sides to it. So one is you've been having a really good run. Um, you're, you know, mm. like you've been saving, you've been investing. I'm seeing a lot more uh, clients uh, come to me with their um, contributions based on investment, successful investment. 
um, rather than just putting money in the bank, not financial advice, nothing like that. That's just not what I'm here for. But essentially, um, you've generally got a little more nous about you, a bit more experience, understanding of the world, um, maybe talking to your friends a little bit more. I think we're we're in an age now where there's a lot more information available at your fingertips, like the bank's not sending you that uh, letter by snail mail anymore. They're sending it instantly <laughs> to your internet banking platform. So there's a whole lot more information that's available to you, which I think really arms the age group of 30s to 40s with a lot more information. And um, what I'm seeing is savings, professionals, you know, at the top of their game, um, digging in deep, they they don't have the kids in private school yet, so they've actually got the ability that their capacity is maybe a little more opened up. Um, the other side is uh, people who've potentially had some experiences in life that have changed their circumstances in a detriment, so it's put them behind a little bit. So. I my my view of this age group is you're getting really different life experiences now. You're getting people who've lived and and had certain things um, go on, and the the vehicle of how they move forward can be very different based on whatever those circumstances are. Like you know those that have kids, we love kids. I don't have any, but we love <laughs> kids. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they, they're a liability when it comes to lending. You know, you can take a hundred grand off your borrowing capacity for having one dependent. So, um, yeah. the I, other yeah, side let's, is, let's just, let's just, um, the, I thought it was only 30 or 40 or 50 K. Like what's this hundred K number? Like what, what, what uh, is, is that depending <laughs> on what you're spending on them? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, you put your kids through, through private school, um, you're looking at, you know, the assessment of those expenses are outside the standard living expense um, measure. So it's not necessarily um, just, you know, 50 grand. 50 grand could make or break what your lending opportunities are based on what your goals are. So just understanding that you have choices. And um, I think if you if you prepare and you have conversations, you surround yourself with, you know, chat to your broker, say what your life plan is, talk to your accountant, tell them what you want to do with business, tell them that you want to get into property, be open. Um, that's kind of where I was alluding to before. There's more than just five C's. Communication is a huge part. That communication is not one of the five C's for credit worthiness, but communication um, between you and your partner. Uh, interestingly, I see, um, I have seen uh, and been in some pretty uncomfortable experiences where I'm talking to two applicants, a couple that are, uh, you know, looking at their finances. Obviously, that's why they've come to me. But then there's this undisclosed 50 grand worth of credit card debt that they've mm. gone and used to buy all sorts of toys and fun things and not told their partner about. Oh, wow. So, um, oh, so you just dig that up in front of them, just get the meeting, line them both up. Just wanted would... to uh, <laughs> just <laughs> raise this. And also, yeah. who do you raise it with? Which which partner do you? You don't know which one owns the debt, so it's like... <laughs> Well, the, the beauty is, aside. you're right. So you can ease, you can keep information hidden. That's fine. But when it comes to lending, those things are out on the table. We see them on your credit file. You can't hide that kind of stuff. And um, the lender's going to see it. So you might not disclose it to your broker. Maybe they don't run a credit check before they submit your loan. But that bank's going to come back and say, hey, there's 20 grand worth of undisclosed liabilities here. What's that all about? Mm. So um, communication, I think, is really kind of important um, around that. Let's just let's talk about the fifties. Let's talk about the the big five zero, the half a century. Congratulations, guys, for making it this far. Um, this is a good year. These are this is this is prime time. This is the time to be. Um, so these people have been around the been been around the world a couple of times. Um, 
50 feels like well, maybe they haven't you know, some... maybe they haven't been anywhere maybe they've not no, well, I mean the, the, the world's the world's spinning quite a few times for them um yeah. but but uh, how, how do we think about lending for this because we may have a little bit more equity we may have a little bit of we, our kids actually one of the things is kids right you we were talking about teens um these kids are now over 18 they're now no, no longer a dependent they're no liability for you your 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 broking has opened up for you the gates the floodgates have opened Yes. How do we think about this yeah. age? I think it's a pretty fun age because there there's an opportunity that opens up in this age group because of the tenure that you've put in in your working years that you've got other opportunities that open. So maybe you've purchased your first home, you've got equity in your property, you're utilising that to, to for leverage. You've got super You've got opportunities that go with self-managed super funds and and lending in that space as well. And I think whilst um, there's a lot of responsibility and it's very uh, restricted um, with the CIS Act about what you can and can't do within um, self-managed super funds, uh, I've been uh, I've experienced over the last couple of years more people in that space and utilizing the the funds that they've essentially worked for um, as another vehicle to be able to invest uh, into and open up other opportunities. And you and you don't have that in your 20s. 100%. 100%. I like it. Yeah. Okay. It does, okay. Uh, it does get a little harder in, in the space of this is where we kind of step into that, what's your exit strategy? The bank wants to know, mm. How are you going to retire with no debt? So this is where uh, your strategy and and purpose behind why you're doing what you're doing starts to become more important, and that communication to the lender of what your plan is, and and realistically uh, looking at that yourself and being realistic about it. I think if you can start to consider how you want to retire, where you want to retire. Um, if you can consider those things in your 20s and 30s when you're in your accumulation stage of, of funds, I think it can aid you when you're getting into those older years. And and if you're in your 50s and and you didn't think about those, like when you're in your, that in your 30s and 40s, um, understanding what your plan and strategy is at this age um, and the decisions that you make and the impact that it makes and really ironing out what a reality is for you with an exit strategy. So some lenders so is, will allow using super, some lenders will allow you to hmm. downsize. What if you're what if you don't have an owner occupied home and you've got into the investing game or you're getting into the investing game? How are you planning to have those repaid? by retirement or what's the strategy around it and this is where i strongly believe you know when you're looking in this space this is where you want to be a little more um uh what's the phrase not necessarily conservative but more um weighing up the the pros and cons a little more you can't really take as many risks yeah, as what you may take. in your 20s and i think this is where you know, engaging like with you, Joe, where it's saying, well, why are you investing? Where are you investing? What are you, what's the plan behind it? What kind of like, are you looking for higher rental yields? Are you looking for capital growth? What, what infrastructure is going on in this area? Um, what's the purpose behind the investment? Because yeah. it's got to be purposeful based on, I mean, People are living up to 100. My grandmother just, she's turning 91 next month and she's fit as a fiddle, still living in her own house, doing her own thing. Um, so people may be retiring or looking to retire at 65 or 70, but they've still got, I mean, some people are still have another 20 or 30 years ahead of them. So it's kind of looking at what's that, what's that plan. So I highly recommend getting financial advice engaging really supporting and surrounding yourself with um with team with p experts in their field who can 
support provide you the information for you to be able to make a, a, a great decision for what the next couple of years hold. Because when it comes to lending, when it comes to the bank, they want to know how you're going to pay it off in the next, you know, 15, 20 years. Go to this one, right? Um, hi, all. At age 50, female, single, no property, but a good income, growing deposit. In your opinion, do I have enough time to buy an investment property for capital growth that will allow me to leverage into my own property by early 60s? Or should I buy a PPOR and smash the loan? No, it's not financial advice, but just interested in your thoughts. So single, female, no property, but a good income and a growing deposit. Good, what are your good, thoughts good on, on that? I think that might be the I think that might be the person who just said we didn't talk about. Yeah, well, thank you for being so them. open, and yeah, thanks for being so open and putting that putting that down um, because it helps yeah. a lot of people. Um, Absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? I would be interested to know what your thoughts are around this. So I might deflect for a moment here. You know, mm. to, I've definitely got to an opinion, you, Joe. Joe probably has one too. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, just around uh, property cycles. So. For for me, for a, as a broker, it's a numbers game. So what are you earning? What's your deposit? What are you buying? What are we expecting that property to have in a capital growth? Because if it has um, the ability to, you know, um, have a bit of a snowball um, with some accumulation of equity that we can leverage off, um, that's that's great, but what kind of property cycle are we looking at? So this is where um, I have seen people do this. They're usually looking and at um, engaging with an agent because it's really based on driving a, a type agent. of property, a buyer's no, agent. Like, not right. selling agent. I mean, geez, so no, 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 a buyer's <laughs> agent like Joe um, or whomever, uh, but it really is what what are you going to get out of that property what what guts does it have to get you there and what are you yeah. looking to get on the end of it yeah yeah exactly the answer is yeah. what do you want like for me it's age 50 is not mm. not too old if we if we can get access if we have well hang on just go back to this one jeff um yeah. at age 50 if you have a good income and you can borrow and you have a good deposit um you can buy an investment property for capital growth if you there are ways to add value to properties, right? Like, yes. like uh, you know, a fine example is renovation projects. Like we we bought a property last year for four hundred and fifty three thousand. It's now worth five hundred and forty thousand. So it's grown a hundred thousand dollars because we spent twenty grand on a renovation yeah. um, and bought in a good pocket. So ten years is a long time. Five years is a long time, but it does depend on on how much work you're looking to put in to be able to do that. For me, it's you might want to take a few more, like do a little bit more value adding or, you know, renovations, yeah. subdivisions, developments, those type of things and and align yourself with people that are willing to help you with that because that's going to guarantee Depending on somebody's growth. risk tolerance, though, I, I will, I will yes. put that out there because yeah, there is definitely. more risk in, in that type of strategy because it can be well, more. Is, and, there is. Also, yeah. it's – I don't think you can be as passive in the investment when you're in your 50s when you're when you're in your 20 to 30s because i've seen it multiple times people made a decision and and they yeah. go oh it didn't really work out for me that property and i and i <laughs> sold it or um oh i bought this brilliant property uh i sold it i made a hundred grand on it uh, but if i sold <laughs> it now i would have made eight hundred thousand dollars on it yeah. So, um, but the decision of when they bought it, what type of property, what the purpose was behind it, it was a little bit, I want to get my foot in the door with something. I've got time yeah. for it to, to, to work in either way for me, but I've got time to be able to um, mitigate a, a risk in a different way later. So when you're in your 50s, you've still got 20 to 30 years that a lender will accept on an exit strategy for you. You can still get a 30-year loan term depending on overall circumstance and assessment. But I've got a lot of clients that are, you know, 45, 50 that are starting their investment journey now. 